不如,不如我哋开始翻先啦吓，唔够好。Why don't we resume our meeting now? And apologies for keeping you waiting. Let's、uh, do this. You've、uh, answered our sh- five short questions last time. Could you elaborate on, on that, and then、uh, we can uh, uh, also look at the、uh, the responses uh, in uh, in in the three uh, uh, papers, which are more detailed. I understand that there are some issues which we.、Uh, <coughs> uh, Uh, we actually sought、uh, some background information, and they are not relevant to this、uh, bill. For example, the uh, uh, the question of、uh, the use of vehicles. So, for these questions, I, I think you can simply give us a, a brief response because we don't want to spend too much time on those questions. So, I haven't actually introduced you one by one, but. Uh, Uh, perhaps uh, Miss uh, Christine Lo, Lo、uh, and also、uh, the Under Secretary. We also have Mr. Andrew Lai, the Deputy Director of the EPD, Mr. Pang Sik Wing,、uh, Principal Environmental Protection Officer, and Miss Selina Lau from Senior Government Council. So, could you brief us on the latest、uh, response from the Administration, Chairman? I think we will stick to the、uh, five questions raised at the last meeting. The first paper is about how the <coughs> the impact of the bill on the other sectors. I think regarding those three paper, or the one about、uh, public interest, let, let's go through that one first because the earlier papers that did have already been given to us for some time. If members feel that it is necessary、uh, for you to to elaborate. Further、uh, on the on the papers that you provided us earlier, although last time it was a public hearing, however we already had some discussion on those papers, so I think we don't have to go through the papers again, and members can simply ask questions. So this、uh, today, I think we can focus on the latest paper, which I think the answers given here are also very brief. Well, this is a paper in response to the request for an interpretation of the term "public interest." I think members are concerned as to whether or not、uh, public interest should include public health, and our paper explains that this actually is possible. So, uh, uh, after members have read this、uh, paper, I'd like to、uh, know whether or not members have any specific questions for us. Our legal advice is also here uh, uh, to help. Why don't we, you know,、um, focus on this one first? Okay, the first question that is uh, uh, to uh, add the term public health or replace public interest by public health. I think Mr. Dennis Kwok and Mr. Chen、uh, Kalong、uh, also raised the same question. Mr. Wu Chuai, thank you. I've read the response from the administration, and I think this is different from our discussion last time. The bureau only points out that protecting public health is an important consideration of public interest, and we understand that public interest certainly should include a basket of elements, and that is clear. Except that for In an environmental protection policy, I think the the health, public health issue, should be given a high priority, and I don't think we should、uh, describe them as important. I think we should have important criteria or yardsticks. In some countries, they have a single index to reflect that when it comes to. Uh, public interests. Uh, uh, they in in the United States, for example, they would uh, uh, <coughs> use public health as the single factor. I I don't think that we should have a single index to reflect public health. We should also、uh, bear in mind the other elements, except that in 
course of interpreting what is public interest, we should highlight uh, uh, what the Secretary for the Environment would consider to be the most important consideration, which is public health, and that this uh, element should be included in the bill. I, so I'd like to know whether or not the Bureau can provide for a more <coughs> a precise interpretation of public interest, or public health rather, so that uh, the public would know. And also, going forward, when the government formulate any policies, this is a factor which must be taken into consideration. I'll try to respond to the question, and our legal advisor can also supplement. I think there's. I think we need to look at several ordinances uh, uh, together. First of all, the old ordinance, and also certain uh, rulings made by our court before. And thirdly, our policy. The policies are not contained in the laws, but I think the present administration has stated clearly that public health is very important. If we should put all these together, uh, we think that the, in the APCO, it is not necessary for us to amend this uh, ordinance. We do not deny uh, what Mr. Wu Chi Wai has said earlier, but the question is whether or not we have this need to do it. Chairman, over the last decade or two, I think Christine would know very well that there have been many controversies surrounding environmental issues because the government, regarding the balance between development and environmental protection, the government has changed its stance uh, uh, many times, uh, which uh, resulted in the public being very skeptical, and it's also making it also very difficult for you to implement environmental policies. While this is a difficult issue, for a start, could you, you know, <clears throat> you know, uh, provide a clear interpretation. And secondly, in other countries, uh, they may use a, a term that is more loose because the platform of that of the government uh, is determined by a, a process of democratic uh, uh, election, but in Hong Kong we haven't come to that stage yet. Uh, eventually, who is going to be the Secretary for Environment is the is in the hands of the CE who who appoints the person to be the Secretary. So, so the clearer we provide for uh, a definition, we can on the one hand uh, highlight the ultimate objective which the bill wants to achieve, and at the same time, uh, we can avoid uh, the. Uh, distortion of our conclusions because the Secretary is appointed. So in the interpretation uh, of public interest and given that so much powers are given to the Secretary, I think we should state clearly that the Secretary should uh, place a, a very important uh, weight on the question of public health. Uh, let me put it this way. In the U.S. legislation, uh, they only consider the public health uh, or the health protection factor. In, in the EU, uh, Australia, and, uh, and China, they have a broader uh, scope. So public interest, uh, the definition of public interest, other than the U.S., uh, would, I think our definition is similar to those jurisdictions. And secondly, we also have uh, court rulings or, or case laws uh, to <laughs> explain what elements are included. And thirdly, whoever is the Secretary for the Environment, he cannot deviate from uh, the, uh, the, the, the rules which have been laid down. So you can say that if we were to define public health more clearly, would that be better? Yes, I think we have more members coming back to the Chamber now, so I'll have to we start exercising time management. May I suggest four minutes each? Mr. Wu Chiwai, you may <coughs> wait for your second turn. I'll ask the legal advisor to, to, to explain first, and then uh, 
uh, and then Mr. Dennis Kwok can put his question. Thank you. To provide some background for members, the term used in the bill is to promote protection of air quality in the public interest. Actually, these terms are the same as those used in the existing ordinance. And, the, and these have been considered uh, after the court had made judgments. We've studied these case laws and we believe that the court would say that public interest should include public health and other elements such as social and economic factors. The term used in the present bill are the same as those used in the air pollution control ordinance. We, so in the bill, we say to promote the protection of air quality and the best use of air in the public interest. I think this would apply to the interpretation of the case laws. Okay. Uh, uh, I think Mr. Dennis Cork would now like to follow up. Well, the question is this. At the moment, under, under Section 10, bracket 2, Section 12 of the EIAO, Section 12.2, it is clearly stipulated that when the Secretary for the Environment decides where to not to issue an EP, he will have to take into consideration the public health factor. Now, Christine, we can see that the EIAO, um, um, uh, uh, I think, should uh, uh, required that the Secretary should uh, consider public health. But in the uh, APCO, and when you set the AQO, uh, the Secretary only need to consider public interest. When you decide whether or not to approve an envir environment permit, let's say you want to decide whether or not to build uh, you know, <coughs> an incinerator and consider whether or not the emissions will have uh, a grave impact on public health. But so long as uh, it doesn't exceed the AQO, the Secretary can issue the EP. So you see there is a contradiction here. Uh, the two legislations simply do not uh, you know, match. Section 12C said that you must take into consideration public health, while at the time when you set the AQO, public health is only one of the factors to consider. So, for certain projects, it's obvious that they cause or pose a uh, great health hazard to members of the public. So, the Environment Bureau can e decide to issue an EP because the um, limits are not exceeded. And that is why... Uh, we um, want to put it in the public house because we want the two pieces of legislation to converge. That's the first point. Second, or, or perhaps you can address this point first. Yes, um, perhaps you can um, give her some time to give a reply and then you can queue up again for, your, um, uh, um, for the next round. Now, if we include public health, then in future, when we um, study um, uh, a project, uh, then, then what difference will, will that make? Now, in setting the AQOs, public health is only one of the factors under public interest. But even if I um, uh, also include public health, the situation will be the same because um, in setting the AQOs, I will not um, simply look at public health alone. So when, when we um, um, issue the EP or when we lay down the AQOs, what, what difference will that make? So we are proposing that public health should replace public interest and, and the situation will be very clear and that is in deciding whether to amend the AQOs in the future you will take into account public health so, so in other words you, just, you only look at public health 
and the, your, um, this um, piece of legislation will converge with the EIAO. Um, per se, for a certain project, we know very well that there will be um, serious health hazards caused to the public, but then uh, an EP may still be issued because the AQOs can be met. So Mr. Dennis Quart is trying to point out that if we um, um, use um, the term public interest in this bill, while um, in the EIA all the term public health is used and there um, uh, will be um, uh, a contradiction. But then do we agree that we should replace public health um, or, or replace public interest with public health in this bill? Yes, of course, we need to take into account um, the convergence between the two pieces of legislation. But then is convergence our only concern? Um, we may think public health is very important, but then there are other factors which are also quite important. Yes, Mr. Lai. Yes, I want to give members um, some uh, supplementary information here. Under the present Air Pollution Control Ordinance, we clearly need to consider public interest in setting or revising the AQOs. And as the Under Secretary has pointed out, public interest, um, in fact, uh, is about uh, a number of factors. According to the uh, WHO guidelines, um, different countries um, come up with different AQOs. Um, um, different places need to um, consider um, 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 various factors, um, balancing risk to health, technological feasibility, economic considerations, and other political and social factors. And um, we are of the view that the uh, wording and the spirit of the legislation is in line with WHO Air Quality Guidelines um, Global Update 2005. In fact, in this legislative exercise, we are not trying to um, change our objective. It is just that we want to um, just uh, do a rewriting based mm. on the same understanding and interpretation. There is no change, no more, no less. In fact, this bill uh, aims to do three things. First of all, tightening up the AQOs. Second, um, a review every five years of the AQOs. And third, um, a, an exemption mechanism. So um, th there is no change to the interpretation of um public interest. And then second, Mr. Dennis Quark is saying that according to Section 10, Bracket, twel uh, bracket 2 of the EIAO, um, um, there is specific reference to public health. But I want to say that we're talking about two different ordinances. In the Air Pollution Control Ordinance and in the spill, uh, we have um, public interest in Section 7. And with regard to the EIAO, it is true that in Section 10, it is stated that if the DEP needs to issue an EP for a public works project, then under Section 10 of the EIAO, the director has to consider a total of six factors. He has to consider a basket of factors, including the EIA report and how to uh, ensure environmental quality and also public health or, uh, implications, impact on human health, on plants, on the ecology. Uh, but, but then... Uh, I understand that uh, in some EIA reports, so long as the AQOs are met, the um, Secretary assumes that public health can be protected and as a result an EP is issued. Now, I don't think um, um, the, the administration and the members should um, um, be engaged in a direct debate. Now, let uh, Mr. Lai finish and then Mr. Dennis Kwok, to be fair to others, please um, queue up again. 
Mr. Lai, I just want to point out that under the EIAO, uh, in deciding whether to issue an EP, the DEP has to consider six factors under Section 10 of the ordinance. And human health is one of the factors. And I just want to say that um, air quality is only one of the factors to be considered under the EIAO. And uh, when the uh, DEP considers um, human health or public health, um, he doesn't only look at air quality. He also looks at um, noise pollution, water quality, and so on and so forth. So, how many factors should we list in the legislation? Uh, does it mean that um, um, the list must be an exhaustive list? Um, the member may feel that um, the term public interest is um, not specific enough, it's too vague. But then uh, I think we are able to satisfy the spirit of the WHO air quality guidelines, um, taking into account technological feasibility, economic considerations, political and social factors, as well as human health. Mr. Tenkapil, I want to ask a practical um, question. Uh, the Secretary um, has told us that there will be additional roadside air quality monitoring stations in uh, Tuen Mun. And also there will be um, some in Chong Kwan. Oh, I want to know the timetable. According to some green groups, um, um, uh, the, um, the mon prison monitoring uh, stations are not really um, 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 properly or appropriately located. The height is also um, not the optimum height um, to really um, take accurate measurements of um, um, air quality. Now, Mr. Tang, I think we are now um, looking at the five issues um, in, um, in the paper 1202, bracket 02. So perhaps um, they can give you a quick answer, and then we will um, just follow the order in this paper. We will deal with public interest first. Yes, um, um, in fact, that's uh, really part three of the supplementary information. Now, we have 14 air monitoring stations. Three are on the roadside. The, other, um, the others are in various parts of the territory. So these um, AQMSs um, help um, collect data for us, and such data can also be uh, of reference or of reference value to members of the public. In fact, we have been looking at whether we need um, extra uh, AQMSs. We have 14 at the moment. We've completed a review recently and we've decided to set up a general AQMS in Tun Moon. And we're now in the final testing stage for this um, station. And we hope that that station can be commissioned uh, at the end of the year. And then in Chiang Kwan O, as the population is increasing, we uh, also plan to set up a general AQMS there. Uh, and in, uh, we will be consulting the uh, Saikong District Council on the location in due course. So in other words, uh, there will uh, st still only be three roadside uh, monitoring stations, correct? Um, they are in Causeway Bay, Mong Kok, and Central respectively. And they um, are um, located in um, um, heavily built up areas where the road traffic is extremely busy. And so we are of the view that these three um, um, stations can um, take measurements of the air quality at the uh, busiest locations in the territory. But there are some green groups are of the view that the locations of the present monitoring stations are not really um, too good. The height is not the optimum height. So what is your response? So when we um, uh, choose the location, the layout, and when we choose the equipment that we use, we make reference to best practices adopted by WHO and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Now for roadside um, stations, they are right next to the very busy uh, roads. And the, uh, the monitoring station is a single-story structure. But then for the 11 general air quality um, stations, they are um, 
really in the community, and they are um, of a height um, equivalent to um, the third or the fourth floor. So we do act in line with um, international standards. But then um, for AQMSs and roadside stations, they serve different purposes, and so the specifications are also different. I'll queue up again, Chairman. Mr. Chung Shikan. Um, Chairman, I don't think um, public uh, public um, interest um, uh, and public health are uh, in conflict. I think public health is a, sub a subset of public interest. So in other words, public interest covers or includes public health. And so um, there's no reason why we should narrow the scope. Uh, because if we do so, there will be far-reaching implications. Now concerning air quality objectives, uh, of course we we do take into account the um, pollutants, but then I think we have uh, overlooked some other factors. For example, the smell or the odor. What if there is a stinky tofu shop right downstairs? Uh, I'm sure you don't want to go home. Um, you know, um, airliners do not allow people to bring durians um, on board a plane. So I think uh, you need to consider the smell or the odor as well when you uh, look at air quality. The second uh, factor that we've overlooked is temperature. Hong Kong is a very um, crowded place, and sometimes. Um, um, you you may only be um, less than two meters from the uh, um, neighboring windows, and then uh, uh, there may be an air conditioner uh, emitting um, um, uh, giving out a lot of emissions, and then uh, sometimes um, on the podium at the po on the podium level there may be um, air conditioning, and those living right above the podium may suffer. Um, and um, it, the problem may not be very serious in winter, but in the summer months, the temperature may be um, increased by 8 degrees or 10 degrees Celsius. And so if the um, ambient temperature is, uh, say, 33 degrees, then the actual temperature um, indoors may reach over 40 degrees. And in some countries, when the temperature is over 40 degrees, there's no need for people to go to work. So the question is, uh, how long do we have to wait? I think you can answer the question as to whether or not temperature and odor should come under the ambit of the bill. I understand Mr. Chung's concern. According to our Air Quality Control Ordinance, Section 10, Bracket 2, uh, reference is made to the circumstances under which the public can uh, complain to the EPD regarding uh, certain nuisances and the director will can uh, you know uh, you know issue an uh, air pollution abatement notice uh, for the person who causes such a nuisance such as uh, dust odor uh, construction uh, installation materials uh, 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 anything which uh, uh, would irritate the eye, the skin, and other organs, and also the color, uh, yeah, you know, as resulting from emissions and so on. Under the current uh, uh, air quality control ordinance, I think uh, nuisance uh, to the air quality are also included. So to go back to the examples I cited, uh, the persons who are subject to the nuisance can regard that as a nuisance and then complain. After which the EPD will investigate and follow up. Uh, he has he has not mentioned uh, the, the 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 temperature factor. I think if people have to close the windows before they can sleep, and they have to spend more on air conditioning, and there so there will be more emission. So I think this is a situation you need to improve upon. And you have to tackle the source of the nuisance. Why don't we regulate that as well? Uh, temp 
temperature is not related to the pollutants in our air. There is no pollutants in the temperature per se. Mr. Chung is asking about the the the, the temperature, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, coming out of the of the emissions. Uh, if the emission is is hot, for example, the 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 emission from the ventilation shaft of air restaurant of restaurants. So we're not just talking about the, the ambient temperature. Actually, well, temperature. Air temperature is a nuisance, uh, and the EPD will handle complaints regarding such uh, nuisances. The FGHD. I think what I think we would uh, you come across in areas like that in Hong Kong. If you if you go on a, onto the street, you'll find the air conditioning facilities of restaurants, part of which are exposed. And if you pass by, uh, you will feel the heat coming out. But that would not be, uh, you know, controlled by the AQOs uh, that we are proposing. And Sly already told members that uh, they are sub-regulated uh, through uh, other uh, provisions. Dr. Elena Wong, thank you. When you said that uh, the term public interest is broader in scope, Whereas public health is also should included uh, under public interest. Well, it's difficult for us to query that. Instead, we're concerned that uh, when we consider the overall uh, public interest, should public health be given the overriding consideration? Uh, because public interest is very broad in scope. Uh, it could be. It could be impact on trade and industry, uh, or the impact on the business environment, and in many of your policies, you would uh, make such assessments. Would that also be included under public interest? You talk about air pollution, you talk about the old diesel vehicles, uh, uh, we think that it shouldn't be allowed on the roads, and then if uh, people are to <laughs> replace such vehicles, money is involved. So when you need to make a judgment as to what constitutes public interest. The interests of particular sectors will say that this has an impact on public funds and then it, it will come under public interest. So in the end, the government, when the government needs to make a decision, is public health the most important factor with the overriding consideration? Perhaps my colleague can also supplement in a while. I think uh, the question is uh, which section of which ordinance we are enforcing. We are now talking about the AQO, that is how do we set the uh, air quality objectives. We have also uh, uh, obtained some information regarding pollutants. Of course, some people would say that this is not the ultimate AQO. Only the, A the ultimate uh, version will give us the, the best protection uh, to, for public health. Uh, what we're proposing is the interim objective, and the WHO is saying that given the uh, development in the jurisdiction concern, we can set our own AQO bearing in mind the local circumstances. The WHO is saying that public health, even though it's so important, it's the overriding mission. But when policies are formulated, when different countries need to enact legislation, you, you, they cannot rule out the consideration of other factors. Back to Hong Kong, if we need to formulate a policy, right now we have different policies like requiring vessels to switch to cleaner fuel, encouraging car owners to, 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 to switch to more uh, you know, uh, environmentally friendly vehicles. We want to achieve certain objectives through certain measures and the focus is on public health. But how do we achieve that purpose? For example, how much money would be required to achieve that purpose and how do we need, we need to compromise before we can achieve that purpose? So the setting of the AQO per se, in the long term we want to achieve a certain uh, aim or objective and there's no conflict between the two. But then there may not be such a direct. Uh, I mean, public health is obviously very important, but 
let's say, requiring vessels to switch uh, to, to the use of cleaner fuel, should that be the overriding uh, uh, consideration? Uh, here we're talking about how we can resort to public funding and legislation and bargaining with the trade before we can do that. Of course, public health is the the is the the the, the, the uh, what is what motivate us to do all these things. But I don't think you should uh, uh, put it in a law that uh, the public health should be overriding. But my colleague can elaborate uh, in a clearer manner. Like the uh, uh, Prime Secretary said, public health certainly is. Uh, uh, Part, uh, an important part of public interest when we set the AQOs. But in the legislation, we can't say that this is an overriding consideration. Because once you say a particular factor has, it should be given an overriding consideration, then when the government sets the objectives or formulate public policies, the factors to be considered uh, I think the government will be constrained uh, uh, in terms of the number of factors that it can consider. For example, when we set uh, AQ, uh, AQOs and so on, if public health should be the overriding factor, and if today we propose that the diesel vehicle should be phased out, uh, then perhaps all diesel vehicles should be phased out. Because definitely, its emission, the emission will have some impact on public health, except that uh, the Euro one, two, three models will have more adverse uh, impact, uh, and we want to pragmatic and eliminate those first. So when we formulate the policy, we have to bear in mind the technical feasibilities, the impact on the economy and society. We have to consider a basket of factors. If we narrow the consideration to to public health, which is given overriding uh, weight then all the other factors which should be considered will not be uh, reflected in the mechanism. And this actually is not uh, 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 conducive to formulate policies and AQOs. Right now, when the Secretary considers uh, setting the uh, AQOs and uh, uh, I think bearing in mind uh, the need to, to take care of public interest should also include public health. Mr. Gar uh, Gary and I'm sorry I was attending the PWCC meeting just now and if my question had already been raised, uh, uh, please uh, by all means stop me. I would like to refer to CP1 uh, bracket 1 1055 bracket 3. I am most concerned about uh, the uh, nitrogen oxide issue. Well, today we would like to, uh, first of all, uh, uh, focus our discussion on the uh, five brief responses uh, uh, to our questions raised the last time. And we're now uh, discussing the question of public interest. Mr. Yik Chi Ming, your first round. Thank you. I think our discussion today uh, on public interest and public health. I think Dr. Helena Wong uh, actually put, was putting the question in a different way. Uh, I personally, I think we should consider public interest. If public health were given the overriding weight, uh, then it, uh, it simply cannot be enforced. I think the previous uh, secretary told us that there is a cost to environmental protection. We have to consider the local circumstances. If there are certain vapors which are, are lethal, then of course you need to enact legislation to ban it. But if we talk about what is contained in the overall uh, atmosphere or on the air, I think we need to do things step by step. Bearing in mind the historical background, uh, you cannot, for example, adopt the AQO for the Maldives and apply them to Hong Kong because our economy are different, uh, circumstances are different. So we need to adopt a progressive approach and uh, and 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 consider public interest. Okay, I don't think we need a response to that, Mr. Wuchi Wai. Your second round. Thank you, Chairman. I think earlier members might have already discussed this point. I'd just like to clarify this. I want the Bureau to consider this. The Secretary and the Director said that public health certainly will be 
the objective that they will consider in uh, in this bill. I agree that when the secretary consider the objectives, he would bear or set the objectives. He would he need to consider uh, basket factors. Well, we understand that uh, that uh, once every three to five years, you need to review the AQOs. It's in, in within the powers of the secretary to revisit the AQOs. Whether or not he 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 will review the AQO definitely yes. Uh, then, but in, in, even if, despite the review, he can decide whether or not to change the AQOs, right? The decision to amend the AQO or not is in the hands of the secretary. What I'd like to know is that when the secretary decides to amend the AQOs, what would be the basis for that decision? And that basis should be based on the basket of factors and public health should be given the, the, the biggest weight uh, to reflect that when when the secretary makes that decision, public health is a very important element. Even if you told me that it's no, no different from uh, what it used to be, since we have the opportunity to enact this bill or legislation, I think we, can, we should take the opportunity to resolve any uh, misunderstanding or controversies we had before, why don't we tidy things up? You know, uh, uh, by making use of this opportunity, uh, uh, because uh, previously people have the impression the secretary and the government will always put the economy first, and all other factors are not given the, 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 an equally important uh, uh, consideration. I agree that you need to consider a basket of factors, but through the, this process, I want you to. You know, you, you incorporate this uh, this concept into the bill. I understand. I I, I I certainly agree with Mr. Wu's points. The question is how we can do that. Perhaps we can go back and and uh, you know consider this more thoroughly uh, and see whether or not we can put members' my hearts at ease because for such a long time there have not been any changes. Uh, the officials uh, will have to remind themselves that they would need to tighten, tighten the objectives. There are two things Mr. Wu can consider. First of all, the objective. The objective is uh, derived from the WHO framework, and the overriding consideration is public interest and public health because we are adopting the WHO framework. Secondly, previously the AQOs were not updated um, um, after long periods of time. This will not happen again because it is stated in the bill that there will need to be a review once every five years. And also, Uh, 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 we, we've told the uh, EA panel chairman that we need to um, give um, reports to the EA panel uh, annually. So we understand that um, uh, uh, electrical members as well as members of the public will not allow us to leave the AQOs um, uh, untouched. Um, So, uh, in fact, uh, WHO also um, says that um, a basket of factors needs to be considered, and public health is, of course, um, an important factor. Mr. Uh, Dennis Kwok, uh, concerning public health, I think I've already um, um, made my arguments um, clear. I want to say that um, for um, 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 uh, those um, applying to uh, carry out a certain project, when, they, uh, when he applies for an EP, there is no need to um, um, uh, do a public health um, assessment. And so very often, when the um, uh, DEP looks at the application, he merely looks at whether the AQOs um, are met. But then there are projects which clearly have um, a... Um, uh, um, um, as a series or have uh, adverse um, impact on public health. 
and that is why um, I am of the view that public health should be um, a over an overriding concern. Duration. Is it not possible to make the law out of the law? This is our reason for the reason. But I just want to make sure that. Um, that the um, public health as a key factor um, for consideration will be fully reflected in the um, bill. And let me uh, make another related point, Chairman. Now, if under the existing legislation, if the secretary wants to uh, revise the AQOs, then he only needs to um, amend the technical memorandum. But then under the bill, the AQOs um, can be amended only um, after the uh, legislation has been amended. So. Do, do you think that would um, make it more difficult for AQOs to be amended? Now, because at present, if the secretary wants to revise the AQOs, he can do so by uh, amending the technical memorandum. But in future, if AQOs are to be um, amended, then um, the legislation will all have to be amended first. You may say that at the moment we need not come to let go, so we can easily. Um, Update the uh, AQOs ourselves, but I don't know whether you, uh, the LegCo welcomes such an approach. In other words, by passing LegCo and uh, amending only the technical memorandum. Now, if uh, we um, need to come to LegCo, then there can be um, a discussion with, me with members and. And um, so, so if we need to tighten up um, the legislation or the AQOs, we we can um, uh, always come back to LegCo. My my colleague may wish to supplement. In fact, under the uh, present ordinance, if the secretary wants to change the uh, AQOs, then um, the technical memorandum uh, needs to be amended, and uh, an amendment to the TM uh, is. Um, uh, is a piece of subsidiary legislation which is subject to negative vetting by LegCo. And so, even if we amend the TM, we also need to go through the four plus three procedure, four weeks plus three weeks. And we are of the view that as um, revising the AQOs is a major public policy decision, we Proposing that if AQOs are to be amended, they should be done through a legislative amendment, so that um, there can be thorough discussion uh, in the council, and also LegCo will have more time to um, discuss the um, amendments because for negative vetting there is um, a deadline. But then, if it's a legislative amendment, then there can be um, more time for members to discuss the proposed changes. And I would be, and so I believe members uh, would, would welcome that approach. Yes, I, I understand um, your position. It's just that um, some um, deputations have asked this question. Question and so I think I also need to ask you this question, Mr. Tenkapu. I just want to state my view on um, public health um, as to whether public interest includes public health. Now we've already seen uh, some um, court cases, um, and if we um, narrow the narrow the scope. Um, if we change um, the term to public health, and I'm worried that EIAs, um, which are, are going on, um, uh, may, may um, encounter problems, and there may be um, um, challenges uh, 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 in court. Now, uh, um, the term public health is in the EIA ordinance, and I think what is important is that the department must make sure that it uh, takes into account public health and the other five factors in um, approving EP applications. So, administrative measures are important, and uh, are there administrative? Um, Policies or measures to make sure that the DEP looks at all the six factors. So, I want to uh, ask whether the um, um, DEP uh, 
does uh, take into account all the factors now because the AQOs haven't been updated for 25 years and if we are to change the AQOs and then at the same time if we want to change the um, term public interest to public health then we may be having too many changes at the same time and I am uh, really worried that public health is um, narrower in scope than public interest. Right, so um, I think we can move on to the next point in the paper. Um, um, a, a list of items of legislation to which the AQOs will be applicable to and the application does not require the said AQOs to be further implemented into the piece of legislation concerned either by positive or negative vetting after the new AQOs come into operation. Right, can the administration briefly explain uh, its very um, concise response and then members can ask questions. Yes, Chairman. At the last meeting, Uh, members asked whether um, the amendments would um, affect uh, public policies. Now, I want to say that only two pieces of legislation will be affected. First of all, the APCO and then the EIAO. Uh, I mean the part on um, um, uh, air quality assessment. In other words, when even if um, AQ, new AQOs are... Um, Adopted, it doesn't mean that the transport department will um, or its its policies will be uh, immediately affected. Mr. Tony Chair, um, uh, um, and, and concerning EIAs, uh, some suggest that there should be this transitional period of thirty six months. And some say that um, at the moment we should uh, still uh, uh, follow the uh, AQOs. But if there are major adjustments, then um, should the uh, uh, present AQOs still be adopted or should the new ones be adopted instead? Is there some flexibility in this regard? Mr. Lai. We do understand Mr. Chair's concern, Chairman. Under the EIAO, when a DEP approves an EP for the proponent of a public works project, then the proponent should implement the project in accordance with the um, original EIA and the conditions imposed by the DEP. Now, under the EIAO, it is stated that if the proponent in the course of the um, um, application needs to um, amend um, its proposal, for example, the proponent may uh, want to um, uh, construct a road, but then because of geological um, problems, there is a need to shift the road eastwards or westwards, say for 10 meters. Then under the present ordinance, the um, proponent has to um, obtain approval from the DEP uh, on the uh, change of the uh, content of the works or the project. And um, under the ordinance, the DEP, in looking at um, this application, has to um, um, work under the um, requirements of the existing legislation. Now, uh, um, uh, if the AQOs are revised and if there is no transitional period, now we are, of course, proposing 36 months, um, then... If we don't have the transitional arrangement, then in future the DEP has no choice but to use the then prevailing AQOs to um, um, study 
the、um, revision to the content of the project, and then as a result, he he can't enjoy any flexibility. And under the EIAO、uh, concerning an application to. Um, um, the change、um, of the EP. There is no distinction between、um, a major change or a minor change in the scope of the project. So we we can't say that for major adjustments we should follow the new AQOs, and for minor amendments we'll just stick to the existing ones. We can't do that. So in other words,、um, the um,、uh, adjustment made by the promoter may be a big one or it may be a small one. Still, um, uh, um, DP sticks to the、um, AQOs prevailing at the time the approval、um, is given. But I- I'm worried that people may think that when the AQOs are、uh, revised, it will be、uh, more difficult to obtain an EP, and that's、uh, that's why people will rush to obtain EPs earlier, and, and they may start work. Um. um Uh, many years later, I don't think this will happen because EPs are required for major projects, and I I believe the proponents、uh, do want to start and complete the works as soon as possible. But but、uh, strictly speaking, that that's not um. Uh, 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 a uh, a problem、uh, related to this present bill. Mr. Chairman, your understanding is correct. Uh, for the AQOs,、uh, we intend to um, um, tighten them, tighten them up, and as a result, the um, um, vetting and approval of EPs um, uh, will be affected. And that's why we are in this context proposing the transitional period of thirty-six months. So, simply put,、um, the administration is of the view that the、um, worry is not. Warranted, because、uh, some deputations、uh, voiced this concern. Now, I do have confidence in the government's assessment, and if the administration feels that this worry is、um, not warranted, then I, I, I,、um, I think it's okay.、Um, now. Um, concerning whether、uh, proponents will、um, obtain the EPs first because the、um, present AQOs are more relaxed,、uh, um, that 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 will not happen because、um, prices、um, may go up. And so, when、uh, proponents have obtained their EPs, they、uh, would <coughs> start the works as soon as possible because it may take quite a long time to obtain an EP. So, I don't think this、um, scenario just、uh, will not arise. Mr. Lai. The EIA is is one of the considerations before these large projects proceed. For example, you also need to go through the town planning procedures and and also resolve the land issues. So, if the project were were delayed, it may not be due to the fact that the proponent had、uh, you know、uh, you know obtained you know、uh, submitted the EIA、uh, report earlier,、uh, but So, so I mean, it may not be due due to that reason, right? Do members have any further questions on the response to our second question, Mr. Dennis Kwok? In Annex A, there are eleven projects. The 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 eleventh project is the construction of the third runway. I think in the information we provided for members last time, yes. In the study brief,、uh, will the new AQO apply, or, or will, will the、uh, old AQO be 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 used? Well, the the EIA study is on underway for the third runway, and the airport authority had indicated that when they build the third runway, they will adopt the new AQO as the basis. But that study was. Well, was based on using the old AQO as the as the basis.、Uh, be, uh, yeah, before the new、e- AQOs are approved, the existing AQO,、uh, the so-called old AQOs, but the airport authority has indicated that when they、uh, 
uh, uh, prepare the uh, EIA report, they will they will aim uh, at uh, satisfying the new AQOs. Okay. Any further questions? If not, shall we move on to question three? As any plan of the administration to enhance the current arrangement on measurement of AQOs? And uh, Mr. Tang already asked a similar question. So, do members have any further questions on on this one, Mr. Uchi Wai? I understand that uh, you, the reason why you've chosen these three most populated areas to set up the uh, monitoring stations. So, are you saying that the data the data collected from the other districts will not be uh, show that the air quality is inferior to uh, those collected in in these three allocations? Uh, in other words, the question is whether they they picked the three worst look uh, you know uh, lo locations because sometimes we hear arguments. Uh, uh, People are saying that well, those three locations are the worst, uh, and and no other districts will, will come back with uh, uh, an inferior air quality. Well, these uh, uh, roadside air monitoring stations, which operate 24 hours a day, I don't think any other cities in the world, uh, you know, operate like Hong Kong. You have 24-hour air monitoring stations along on the roadside, not. Not many many countries don't take me measurements like we do. Uh, if you look at some of the other cities, if you go to those cities, do they actually have an air roadside air quality monitoring stations uh, 24 hours uh, a day in operation? I have not found many such examples. Uh, uh, in Hong Kong, we're able to have uh, you know data for the whole year. So. As far as taking roadside air pollution is concerned, I think we are leading the world. To s the question is, what are these three monitoring stations representative? You could say that we've picked three locations which are heavily populated and with a heavy uh, vehicle, vehicle tra traffic and located at the center of the city. So, and, and then we measure the, 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 the emissions in those areas. We're saying that you wouldn't be able to find another road or street where the. Of course, there would definitely be some places where the air quality, roadside air quality, is even worse. But uh, we've seen some green groups taking instruments to uh, and, and measure and uh, take measurements in places, uh, yeah, and say and come back with uh, data which is even worse than central or in China. The figures that they have published, uh, we've looked at those figures, but the deviation is not so big. Uh, I, I suggest that we're looking at a different uh, scenario altogether. So, does the information collected from these monitoring stations provide us with sufficient data to help us formulate policies? Uh, it's not really the case that we should set up monitoring stations on each and every street. Uh, uh, so we set, we build these air mo quality monitoring stations uh, 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 to help us formulate policies. The question is whether or not there are enough of these stations, and the question is should we build more such stations. So these three stations uh, 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 is a tool to help you formulate your policies. But we could argue with you regarding the air quality in different districts and areas. And we may need to re resort to other tools if we do that. If you want to know about the air quality station in a particular area, you can certainly go there and take measurements. Are there any reliable tools that you can provide? Because people may use different tools to make take measurements. And in the end, there will still be arguments over the the, the validity of the data. I think Mr. Tam is the expert. Uh, perhaps I'll add that we don't need to worry too much about this. The green groups uh, will use mobile tools to take measurements. You would look at the range of the results. Uh, is it so different that uh, we're talking about a different scenario? The answer is no. 
those three monitoring stations operate around the clock, and they will give us uh, a total picture of uh, of the situation in the in the three business areas. Well, I think what Mr. Wu is asking is whether or not we sh the EP the the the, the uh, EPD should take these reliable tools and try to take random uh, samples in different parts of the territory. You have the fixed monitoring stations in three at three locations. You can't build too many of such stations. But do you think it's worth your while to, to do that as well? Still alive. Like the uh, Deputy Secretary said, this setting up I think Hong Kong is already uh, ahead of many other countries as far as Rosai monitoring stations are concerned. In many cities, they only have community monitoring stations, and then the air quality sample will be better. The, the sample taken near the road would be inferior. For our three Rosai monitoring stations, I think they are quite representative, and they can reflect uh, the environment where you have many skyscrapers, heavy vehicular and pedestrian traffic. And we think that the three roadside monitoring stations can. I think if people are, 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 look, are in a heavily uh, uh, populated area or very busy area, uh, they can say they find that the air quality in the area they are in is similar to the air quality collected at our three roadside uh, monitoring stations. So, it, so it would it would it would provide a useful yardstick as to whether we would like to uh, take handout tools or devices to take measurements in other parts of the territory. Uh, we have actually. Uh, consider that. If members are interested, we can take you to visit our uh, monitoring station. You'll find inside these stations many equipments which monitor the air quality around the clock. They are very precise instruments. So the accuracy requirements is very stringent. If we only take a handheld tool to take uh, you know, the air, uh, air sample in a particular area, then, then that we have reservations about the, 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 the scientific validity of such data. Ms. Sito, thank you. Every time there is a uh, you know infrastructural project, there would be an air quality assessment. I'd like to ask the administration whether they ha upon the completion of s such infrastructural projects, uh, have you ever taken these uh, handheld uh, devices to go to the area in question to, 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 to check whether or not the EIA report submitted earlier were, ac were accurate, although you can't you know, change the, uh, the situation when the project, well, when the tunnel or the flyover has really been built. At least we can know uh, whether the previous uh, assessment was accurate, and if it is not, uh, was it due to other factors? For example, the other tunnel was closed off, uh, uh, and the air quality should have been better. But because of other uh, infrastructural projects, uh, the air quality has turned out to be worse. So I think you need these uh, post-project, uh, uh, you know, evaluation. Otherwise, you know, uh, I think uh, the the measurement will be less and less accurate. So I think you would need to conduct such assessments after major infrastructure projects have been completed. Mr. Tam, thank you. After the EIA, uh, for major projects, for example, power stations, we would require them uh, to set up their own monitoring networks. Say within the power stations, they are already doing this, and the data they collect are also uh, submitted to us. 
chairman, I'll, I'll then, uh, uh, you know, put the question uh, in two ways. First of all, for large infrastructures like power stations, you say they keep supplying you with the data that they've collected. When there are deviations, how would the administration deal with it? Of course, you would know uh, the causes for the deviation, and you can check where things have gone wrong. And secondly, for the infrastructural projects undertaken by the government, uh, say a tunnel or a flyover, is it the case that once the project is finished, you will just, just let it be? I think we would need to look at the impact of the emission. So if it affects the air quality for the entire territory of Hong Kong, then when we approve the uh, the EP, we say that we need to undertake such surveillance work. But air quality monitoring or assessment If it is shown that the objective is met, then we may need not need further monitoring. It would depend on how that project impacts on the air quality uh, before we decide whether or not we need to check. So we're talking about two issues here, or two things here. First of all, the infrastructural project which uh, is a major you know, source of emissions, such as a power plant, then you would know what generators they will use, whether it's uh, uh, they use gas or, or natural gas, and you can actually assess uh, what the emissions will be like before the project is finished. Uh, we're looking at mature technologies here, and I don't think we've seen any major uh, problems. For other infrastructural projects, for example, in this district, I'm going to build a road, and the road doesn't emit anything uh, itself, but, ra but the emission will come from the additional vehicles that will travel on this road. So the EIA calculation will be different. It will look at uh, the situation, that is, after the new road is being built, how many more, how many vehicles will be using this road, and how the emission from such vehicles will affect the air quality there. And if you're satisfied it doesn't exceed a certain objective, then the EP can be issued. So two separate issues here. I understand, Chairman, uh, the power stations, of course, uh, have, you know, <coughs> is a source of emission, and the emission could be controlled. So when you go there for your inspection, you can uh, you find that the emission is different from what was indicated in the uh, EIA report, that measures can be taken to rectify that. Road, for roads, you can only uh, do things uh, in terms of the uh, topography of the area and so on and so on, but they could be affected by other infrastructural projects. For example, if another flyover were built, then the traffic could be diverted and the situation air quality may improve. Or on the other hand, if a large housing development is uh, completed nearby, then more vehicular traffic is generated. We have many public, many many projects uh, for roads and so on. Uh, they they don't emit anything themselves, but they would they would uh, you know uh, result in in uh, emissions. So I'd like to ask the government why you do not conduct investigation after the project is completed. To see whether or not your uh, your your monitoring works or not. Of course, uh, in other jurisdictions, they have they they might have uh, similar practices. So I think the post project examination is important to find out whether there are any serious deviation. Right. Um, although. Um we um, do have sufficient time for the meeting. Um, still, I, I think uh, uh, there should be a time limit for um, um, each um, member. Um, uh, no, the, the question may not be directly related to this bill, but um, it's uh, also uh, a relevant issue of concern to us. Now, Chairman, now if every time there is an EIA, 
I have to um, really um, go back uh, and from the uh, uh, air quality per quality perspective, uh, I don't want to give an answer now. And after all, it's not um, uh, directly related to the spill. Yes, I think this is a much wider issue. And um, I think they may need to um, 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 adopt new practices um, in order to do that. Yes, Chairman, I do understand that this is not directly related um, to the bill. But I think this is um, um, members' um, um, concern. Perhaps you can bring this back to the uh, YEA panel um, for discussion. Yes, um, concerning uh, assessment of um, pol uh, the, the pollution level that can be followed up by the YEA panel. Mr. Wu Chi Wai, uh, um, Chairman, I, uh, concerning Monitoring. Now, uh, we're going to have the cruise terminal uh, commissioned very soon. And um, I understand that um, we, we, we um, 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 at the moment won't have um, um, onshore um, electricity supply facilities, and at the moment we do not have the mandatory fuel switch arrangement. So people do want to know how bad the situation can be. I understand that the Environment Bureau plans to uh, introduce legislation on uh, mandatory fuel switch at birth. But then what's going to happen in the interim? What can be done in the interim? Oh, um, at the moment, we, we are trying to offer um, birthing fee um, concessions as an incentive, say for example 10% for um, ocean-going vessels. But then um, should we be doing more in the interim? But I, I, I think um, we need to um, um, know how bad the situation can be. Uh, say, for example, if you tell us that um, the situation is going to be very, very bad, then maybe we uh, may be willing to provide quality diesel to these vessels uh, free of charge while they are at birth in Hong Kong. I don't know. So we, we must have the information. We must have the data. And Mr. Lai said that he did not um, um, support the idea of us using handheld devices to measure um, air pollution. So, how can we come up with the benchmarks? Um, um, uh, I, I think it's really meaningless um, for you to um, use your own set. Um, of criteria, and uh, and we um, talking about another set of criteria. So, I just want to know whether. Um, um, whether we, uh, the public will um, know about um, the methodologies that you use in uh, measuring the uh, pollutants. Um, and of, so I understand that uh, I am talking about um, AQOs, and, um, and, and and this issue may not be directly re uh, related to the bill before us. Uh, Chairman, in fact, I have said um, uh, many times that uh, I, I welcome a discussion on uh, such broader issues in the EA panel. All right, let's try to um, include an item. Um, uh, on the agenda uh, of the EA panel. All right, do members have any further questions on uh, point three of the paper? No. Then let's move on to point four. Last time, members asked um, about the um, um, impact on um, human health of different levels of concentration of SO2. So we've been given this table, Ms. Sit Ho. Um, my question is not directly related to the bill. Now, Chairman. And um, 
um, here um, um, exercising asthmatics um, are mentioned every year we have the um, uh, uh, standard chartered marathon and every year we have um, um, people um, uh, um, who, who um, or may, may even um, uh, die abruptly so we really want to know the impact of uh, SO2 concentration on um, athletes. Yes, I understand um, um, the weather is also one factor and um, you know the weather is uh, unpredictable. You know, last night we all of a sudden had a heavy downpour. Now, so maybe uh, there may be a, a concentration of pollutants but then um, a gust may uh, blow the um, pollutants away. But uh, I hope that uh, before a major marathon race, um, information on air quality should be uh, released to the public. And um, I think the organizer should also um, try to uh, make sure that athletes know of the, um, uh, the weather conditions and the air quality. Now, in fact, I um, also um, uh, take part in the um, marathon uh, race. And what is important is that um, athletes must be adequately prepared for the race, and they must not be um, the um, uh, they, they must make sure that they have enough rest the, um, the night before. Now, in fact, uh, concerning the cross uh, harbor swimming competition, the uh, organizer also wants to know the uh, uh, water quality during the period, and so. I think the same applies to um, the marathon race. Yes, um, Mr. Pang? Yes, Chairman. In fact, the EPD um, does liaise very closely with the organizers of um, such major events, and we uh, try to provide um, the most updated uh, information on air quality to the organizers. Thank you. And, and Chairman? I want to know um, the concentration of SO2 in our air um, on normal days. Now, I don't think um, we, we um, have the levels of um, 6.7 million or 13,000. Uh, so, so what, what is the normal level in Hong Kong? And also, uh, for a marathon, marathon race, I believe um, 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 the shortest time um, uh, needed is um, an hour or so. An hour or so? Are you talking about 10 km? 10 km is, is not um, a marathon race, but I understand that there is a, K, a 10 km um, a, a, a section. In fact, I can only uh, um, cover 7 km within an, uh, an hour. So uh, you, you, are, you are, of course, uh, really um, quite brilliant already. So, and here you're talking about an exposure duration of, say, 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So I think you, when you um, give um, the organizer the um, um, information about air quality, you should also make known the exposure duration. So what is the normal level of SO2 in Hong Kong, or normal days, I mean? We... we at the moment, at the 24-hour uh, indicator, 350 uh, mu g per um, uh, cubic meter, and we want to uh, amend that to 130, uh, 125. Usually, the level doesn't exceed 80 or 90 mu g. So in other words, we are uh, more or less at level 5, 250 uh, per day or one day, uh, lower than that level, lower than that level, all right? And then uh, Ms. Helena Wong, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, concerning... Um, major fireworks display. Um, we have um, three such occasions every year um, um, uh, over the Victoria Harbour, and then of course we have um, that uh, fireworks um, every day at um, Disney um, Disneyland. And so um, I want to know the impact of um, uh, fireworks display on um, human health. 
and uh, concerning your monitoring stations, uh, I understand that none of them can um, measure the uh, level of pollution caused by fireworks, for example, suspended uh, particulates. Right? Again, this is not directly related to the bill, but can you try to give a reply, Mr. Pang? Now, for major fireworks um, display, um, that's uh, uh, um, they they um, take place at the uh, very uh, the high sky, so to speak. But then, will will the will they, um, will, will, will they um, um, uh, fall or drop or come down, and they may um, spread or disperse? And Um, if um, the quality of air that we breathe in is affected, then I think um, that uh, change can be detected by our air monitoring stations, and we did not detect any um, significant, significant change um, previously. So, uh, because um, um, these will um, disperse, and so any change in the air quality will be caught by the eleven general monitoring stations. What I mean is that if there are um, as an impact that can be measured um, at the um, uh, air quality monitoring stations, and we haven't detected any significant change so far. And have you compared um, the normal data and the uh, data um, during the fireworks display? Um, we haven't detected any uh, significant difference. Uh, any impact on human health? I mean, pollutants. Um, um, uh, after the fireworks display, um, um, they may not be SO2. What are they? We don't know. And um, uh, um, would there be an, an adverse impact on human health? Mainly particulates. And we do have measurements concerning PM 2.5, PM 10, and we haven't detected any um, um, major difference pre and post um, fireworks so far. So, are you suggesting that? Uh, members of the public need not be worried at all about adverse um, impact on public health caused by um, fireworks display. Um, Mr. Mm, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lai, uh, a few months ago, a electrical member put in a written question on the uh, impact of fireworks display on human health. Perhaps so I can. Um, uh, issue that reply again to members for their reference. Um, so we're mainly talking about heavy metals and also suspended particulates. These should be the major concerns. But um, concerning um, the fireworks, um, we do um, issue instructions to the um, sponsoring bodies on uh, the heavy metal content, and we do advise them to uh, try to. Um, Purchase uh, environmentally friendly fireworks. Mm. Now, because chairman, because we are concerned about air pollution, um, because um, there will be suspended particulates. I just want to know whether your instructions or, or advice or guidelines um, do have um, legal effect. So why can't we specify um, um, the uh, content? Metal content of um, the fireworks, for example, um, toxic metals must not be allowed because you've only given advice or guidelines. They are not legally binding, and because we're talking about public interest here, public health here. So, can you try to uh, um, impose? Um, um, stringent control, but uh, yes, I understand this is um, a matter of public health, but uh, this is not directly related to the issue of AQCOs. Would or not you are willing to consider members' uh, suggestions? Please go back and think about it. Okay. So, regarding question four and the response to the question relating to the concentration of sulfur dioxide, any further? Follow up. If not, we now come to the fifth question, the last one. That is the number of government vehicles which are pre Euro vehicles. The government's answer is no. So this is only uh, information that members uh, sought last time. So do members would like to ask any other questions regarding the number of government pre Euro vehicles? So uh, we were not just talking about uh, 
uh, Euro 1 and pre-Euro vehicles. We want to, uh, uh, well, I think uh, they're now, you know, eliminating all, you know, uh, Euro 3 models. How many Euro 3 models does the government have? Uh, we will supply the information for members as to how many Euro 2 and Euro 3 uh, um, uh, vehicles uh, that government still has and the timetable for replacement. I think the, the, the standard we, we, we <coughs> impose for ourselves are actually more stringent than those that we uh, impose on the trade. Of course, there will be no uh, subsidy when it comes to government vehicles. So how do you propose to deal with these uh, old vehicles, the hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles? Uh, please give us all those uh, figures so that we don't have to ask them separately. So any further questions re regarding government vehicles? Mr. Michael Teen, Chairman, for the new AQOs, well, I'm not too clear. I think you're talking about Euro 3, Euro 4, Euro 5 models. Uh, does it mean that uh, the Euro 4 uh, will be acceptable for the catalytic converters for Euro 3? After the vehicles have been fitted with the converters, I mean these vehicles are not very old either, so would they already be in compliance? I've asked the experts, uh, the, I've asked KMB, they say the catalytic converters will work. Some experts have a different opinion, because many things are emitted in the emission. So to satisfy your new AQO, does it mean that U2 and U3 will have to be eliminated even if with catalytic converters? Mr. Lai. Regarding vehicular emission, uh, under the Air Con Quality Control Ordinance, uh, it is stipulated that all newly all vehicles newly imported into Hong Kong then uh, they must follow Euro 5. They must satisfy the Euro 5 models by 2015. For the existing vehicles, having uh, Consider the uh, the the uh, emission from diesel vehicles. The government believes that uh, uh, Euro 3 models or models before Euro 3 tends to have a higher emission level, and therefore we are proposing a subsidy and uh, re uh, regulation uh, scheme to eliminate all uh, pre Euro 3 models. For diesel vehicles, we would uh, tackle the problem by through elimination of these old vehicles. Mr. Teen made a very good observation. That is, elimination of such diesel vehicles will not include franchise buses. Uh, this is because earlier we were studying with the uh, bus companies regarding a pilot scheme to install catalytic converters for buses and, and, and see whether or not the uh, nitrogen uh, oxide emission could be drastically reduced. The franchise uh, uh, buses have already been installed with uh, catalytic converter to reduce suspended uh, uh, particulates, except that they were not able to reduce the emission of uh, SO2. And the, uh, and the, the recent pilot scheme uh, for uh, for catalytic converters to reduce NO2, uh, SO2, uh, NO2 submission was successful. So later on, we'll go to the FC to apply for funding so that we can subsidize the uh, bus companies to uh, fit to retrofit the uh, Euro 2, Euro 3 buses with catalytic converters. For the commercial diesel vehicles, because there are many different models and also because of the technology constraint, we cannot. Uh, uh, resolve uh, the problem of emission through this uh, uh, particular catalytic uh, converter. For the new one, there will be need to be Euro 5. For the older vehicles, the private vehicles will be phased out. For the bus companies, you allow them to be retrofitted with catalytic converter. Early on, you resolve the issue of uh, Particulates now it will also eliminate the the, the the NO2. So with the fitting of the converters, will they satisfy the Euro 5 standard? For franchise buses, we are focusing on Euro 2, Euro 3 buses. We retrofit them with the catalytic converters. 
upon installation, then the NO2 uh, the emission can satisfy Euro 4 san uh, standard. For the scheme to eliminate uh, diesel vehicles, uh, anything that satisfies Euro 4 standard will be acceptable. Although the new vehicles, they will need to satisfy, they will need to be Euro 5. For commercial vehicles, why do you have to eliminate them and not uh, allow them to, uh, to be fitted with uh, catalytic converters? For commercial uh, diesel vehicles, anything with 80,000 odd pre Euro 3 uh, diesel vehicles, they could be heavy and light truck vehicles, school buses, and so on. So if we, you have to find a catalytic converter that could be retrofitted to all these different types of vehicles, it would be difficult. But for franchise buses, uh, since they have uh, a limited number of models, we are proposing to retrofit the Euro 2, Euro 3 buses with the catalytic converters, and we only fit them on particular models. For certain models, they simply don't have the space for us to install this converter, and, and, and there's nothing we can do for these vehicles. For commercial vehicles, if they're willing to retrofit the vehicles with these converters, you still no, won't allow that. Or are you saying that you think that, the, that for these vehicles, it simply cannot be retrofitted with the uh, uh, catalytic converters? Given the present-day technology and the space on these, uh, these vehicles, it simply cannot be done. So that's our impression. Mr. Teen. I think Mr. Te Lai and Mr. Pang are uh, really experts and they're able to give us the answers immediately. But again, uh, these questions have nothing to do directly with the bill. And I'm sure there will be other occasions where we can further discuss this issue. Under Secretary? On another for uh, when we discuss the replacement of diesel vehicles, uh, the same point has been raised. Some people say that well, all they needed to do should be uh, uh, to, was to retrofit the vehicles with uh, such catalytic converters. I think we've carried many tests. Well, some people say, why spend so much money? Why simply help these uh, commercial vehicles to be fitted with catalytic converters? If Mr. Teen would like a detailed briefing on the topic, I welcome that as well. But I don't want to spend too much time today on that. I'm sure some people are saying that uh, we're wasting money uh, if we do this. But I'm sure that once we have the, the data, uh, we show Mr. Teen the data, I'm sure he will, he will have the confidence. I'm sure we can certainly take a, a follow-up on this issue uh, on other occasions. Uh, so I think we've just in time uh, and finished all the responses to the five questions you raised last time. And I don't think we have any new questions uh, for the Bureau, uh, but uh, the Bureau can certainly give us further supplementary information uh, members sought uh, today. But I don't think we need to discuss those at our next meeting because they're not directly relevant to the bill. At our next meeting, I hope that uh, we can ask whether members have any questions relating to the broad issues we raised before. Basically, we're talking about the first two. Let's see whether or not uh, members have any further questions. And after we've done that, we can go to the clause-by-clause -clause scrutiny. I'd like to report to members that the next meeting is scheduled for the 10th of June at 8.30 a.m., a Monday. Uh, I think the Secretary has already uh, circulated a notice to members. We have also reserved, uh, and please mark this in your diary, but the Secretary also issued a notice to members later on. That is the 25th of June, uh, a Tuesday at 10.45. We've also reserved that slot as well. So the Secretary will also send out a notice for members later on. 25th of June at 10.45. Um, so if there's no other business, I think we, and it's now 10.30, we may now therefore adjourn. Thank you.